Not all leaders in the animal protection movement are looking to advance the status of animals in the law, which is fine. I think what everybody should be aware of is the historical context of law in social movements and the value of law to social movements. Law has always played a role in helping address the system-wide harms of a given social movement or a given issue. The value that it can add is giving a language and a narrative and solidifying progress for a social movement. Leaders in the animal protection movement have had great successes in raising the social status of animals, which is crucial when we're looking at how to raise the legal status of animals. We absolutely need to have a movement, a public awareness of the issue and public salience of the issue. They've been great at telling stories. They've been great at getting the plight of the animals to be something that people care about. There's also some really important victories and advancements that specific campaigns have achieved. So for example, there's been great legislative advancements, great impact litigation, especially when it comes to getting large dollar amounts that maybe act as a deterrent. There's been great doctrinal development around enforcement of animal law to develop more protections for animals. I think something to keep in mind is how we can use each one of those actions as a way to bring in the bigger narrative and to help people understand where it is we're trying to go as a movement. The leadership in animal law in particular and animal protection as well, I, I would say it, it's impeding its own progress by being so limited in the diversity of who's leading the movement. Animal law, animal welfare, animal protection is incredibly undiverse, which means your, your audience, your message is segregated to a very, very small group of people, right? When we're talking about animal protection, we're talking about everything from horses to cows to dogs to chickens, right? We're talking millions and millions of different variety of animals. But what's interesting about that huge variety of animals that we're trying to protect is that we're often trying to protect this huge variety of animals with this very, very small number of people. As soon as we, I think, engage different communities, we will find different leaders that have their own audiences, that have their own sense of influence within those communities. So that diversity, I think, will bring different messengers and therefore much, much more success within the movement. Not all of our leadership has been willing to or able to grasp how important it is to be progressive in a, in a variety of social justice arenas and not just towards animals, recognizing the interconnectivity of working on this vulnerable community uh, with other vulnerable communities. And that has led to really unfortunate failures among our leaders. And so I think being intersectional, being welcoming, recognizing the connections um, that need to be made are really essential for strong leadership for animals. I've worked in several nonprofit sectors, the environmental sector, the education sector. What I think is unique about our sector is who is in it. There are a lot of young folks joining our movement, especially for me at Factory Farming Awareness Coalition, where we're doing all this outreach to high school and college students in particular. What we're having to do at this time is really help students recognize that factory farming relates to all these different cause areas and that this is actually empowering, that there's something that you can do on an individual level, on an institutional level, on a systemic level. All of this thought process, though, does not happen in a vacuum. We're doing this work while all these other progressive movements are happening. My challenge right now is really making sure that we prepare a workforce for all the different organizations in our movement. It's been difficult because there can sometimes be so much jargon. And we, as we learned here at Brooks Congress, we often are just coming up with solutions as opposed to really identifying what all the various problems are. So there might be an emphasis on, you know, the four day work week or trying to, you know, do something like very specific. But what I like to do is really think about, okay, what do our employees really need? We want to create the ecosystem for our staff to be successful. What is actually going to do that? It's about sustainability. 
And it's the job of leadership to figure out what is going to actually work for your organization. There's, again, a tendency to try and do everything, anything that sounds cool and progressive, but really, what is it actually about? It's about creating the ecosystem for our staff to be successful, and that's what we need to be focusing on. I think what some organizations could try to do more is take into account the science more, what we know about the psychology of people, what it takes to actually affect social change. I think very often we assume that people already have the same views that we do about animals being worthy of protection and all that, but often people don't. Or they have biases just as we do. We have cognitive dissonance where we hold certain beliefs, but then we also like to eat meat perhaps. And the two are really sort of difficult to reconcile for us. So we tend to ignore certain things taking into account these biases that people have better by drawing on the science we have about this, I think could help the movement improve animals' legal status. I think leadership in the animal protection movement has done a great job with the opportunities that they've had to be able to advance the issues surrounding animals, but they've had a hard deck. And despite that, they've been very creative with their strategies, trying to, you know, with the relatively low amount of resources that we've had, bring the issue of animals to the wider public, whether it be through legitimizing animals in the context of social justice issues or helping leverage the media towards shining a light on a lot of the horrific actions happening hidden from the public. Um, so I think that they've done a good job at using the relatively low amount of resources that we have to be able to shine a light and legitimize this issue in the broader public. Leadership is crucial to the animal rights movement because it's what allows other people to become empowered. And the most transformative form of leadership we've seen in the animal rights movement is leadership that cultivates leadership in others. And, and that's not just animal rights, that's civil rights, that's women's rights. You name the movement, the best leaders are servant leaders who share their power with others. And I think what we've seen over the last 10 years is a pretty transformative shift, especially in the grassroots animal rights movement, where we're, we're seeing a new breed of leadership that isn't just about traditional hierarchies and just telling people what to do, but really helping people find their power. And when you help people find their power, that is when a movement starts creating change. I think that leadership, there's two sides of the same coin that sometimes it really helps to have well-known charismatic personalities that are you know, talking about these issues to the general public. A classic example is Jane Goodall. We recently had her uh, join in on a letter to the NIH asking them to stop certain types of uh, primate research involving maternal deprivation and stuff. And so she is just sort of, anything she lends her name to is really helpful because she just has such this amazing reputation and, and personality. The flip side of that is often that you can have organizations become overly reliant on an individual and those individuals sort of treated like they say, like treated like rock stars when, you know, you don't actually need rock stars running organizations. You really need good managers and people who have this organizational knowledge. So I think uh, that can be a problem. And also then you have those people, an organization becoming overly reliant or at the whims or mercies of a, an individual's personality that can lead to some sort of emboldenment and some, some poor behavior as we've seen in recent years in some of the animal protection organizations. Leadership in the animal protection movement has both helped foster a lot of growth, but um, has also come with some unintended consequences. And so I remember when I first came into the movement, I was really enthralled by the work that a lot of advocates were doing. And I attached that work to necessarily to the leaders of those those organizations and and I think that makes sense because leaders are oftentimes the you know the the faces of the organization the voice of the organization and for my first few years in this movement um, that's so that's pretty much how I saw the relationship between the movement and the efforts of an organization and the leaders in um, in those positions. But one of the things that I've I've seen, I've witnessed in the past um, few years is that 
this comes with unintended consequences. And so, for example, if there is uh, bad behavior on the part of leadership or unethical behavior or, you know, problematic business practices, it creates this friction between the organization itself and the leaders in that space. And we oftentimes then see a very problematic attempt to divorce leadership from the organization, the face of the organization from the organization itself. And one particular um, example, uh, prominent example, actually quite recently has been uh, Miyoko Shinner's um, somewhat divorce from Miyoko Brands, um, her food company, which while not necessarily an animal protection organization, is a B Corp and they are sort of a mission-centered or mission-focused organization. The question that we, we find ourselves facing and that they find themselves facing is, you know, how do we sort of separate or distinguish Miyoko, the, the individual, this person who's been removed by the board from Miyoko's sort of the brand, and how does it continue to sort of live on and potentially and hopefully thrive even in her absence. And so, again, I think the the, the critical question that, that animal protection advocates need to ask themselves and that organizations need to ask themselves and that needs to come, I think, from leadership itself is what is the relationship and what is a healthy relationship between um, the leadership and, and the organizations that they represent. I think we have an issue with a lot, a lack of leadership experience. We have a lot of really enthusiastic, passionate leaders, but who don't have a long tenure of leading organizations or managing employees. And so we fall into traps of problem solving in our organizations, setting up structures and systems to succeed, hiring, and we get caught up in the internal side of things where then we're not able to make as much progress as we could otherwise. So I think we need more training and leadership, more ex expertise. I think leadership in the animal protection movement is, is varied and there are different styles, but I think generally underlying leadership is a passion for the cause and a desire to protect animals and to prevent their suffering. Now, sometimes I think this passion can be very valuable because it drives us forward, it motivates, it, it drives us towards a goal, but sometimes I think this passion also can prevent us from seeing other related issues or other potential approaches to achieving our goals. So I think passion is valuable, but also listening and being inclusive and being respectful and being able to hear other ideas is also very important. And I think that that's probably the downside of some of the leadership passion. Uh, so it's a plus and a minus, like so many things. My experience in leadership in the animal protection community has been in an academic setting, because I'm a student now, um, and my first exposure to animal law literature and the animal law movement in general came through a course I took with Professor Kristen Stilt at Harvard Law when I was an undergraduate. I just found that reading cases, thinking about animal issues from a legal perspective was just such a compelling thing to do. Her teaching style was so motivating, so captivating, and, and that sort of example for me as a, as a young undergrad, just sort of finding my way and figuring out what kind of a career I wanted was incredibly inspirational and sort of a, an example that I've, I've looked to in the years since for how leadership can be de deployed in an effective manner. One of the challenges that animal welfare has had and I think is true of really almost any movement, is accepting outside perspectives and accepting disruptors. The more experienced we are, the more we see ourselves as experts, and the more challenging it is to have our expertise challenged. I take a long view on the question of leadership in the animal protection movement. When I first got interested in ethical issues about the way that we treat animals, the humane movement, as it was, been called, consisted primarily of sleepy organizations, some of which were very well-funded. They were not very activist or even supportive of activists. They were not very aggressive in pursuing issues. But there were some scrappy, sort of street-level kinds of organizations that were beginning to form, and people were really beginning to do things. But those organizations tended to be radically under-resourced and really to run off the adrenaline of a, few, of a few people. I think what's happened over my lifetime is that we've begun to see some 
merger, as it were, between the sort of older, larger organizations, and they've been increasingly combined with the kind of energy and activism of the more street-level, grassroots-driven kinds of organizations. So from my point of view, this is a vast improvement over, over where things were a generation ago or, or two generations ago. We've made enormous progress at actually growing effective organizations while, while keeping a real spirit alive in those organizations. And I also want to do a shout out for the Brooks Congress where this interview is taking place because I think these kinds of meetings that really bring people together from all corners of the animal movement, you know, really help in terms of sort of keeping the energy going and providing a kind of incredible sort of adult education for the participants in these meetings.